Um, if you couldn't tell, today is a little bit different of a service. Um, we're going to try to run our camp debrief with you all. So uh, there's a lot of open segment parts that I don't know how we're going to work, so we're just going to trust Jesus that this is going to come out okay. And if it's informal, if there's some back and forth, then we're okay with that. Pastor Eddie's out of town. We can do whatever we want to. It's okay. Um, first of all, I want to recognize that just to be here on stage uh, is a huge accomplishment because you know that for most of you all, public speaking and being in the spotlight scares you to death. So, just as a way to try to calm them down, can we say thank you by being here to both our students in the back, our students in front, um, those who are just helping out. All right. So, um, when I talk about student ministry, I like to bring up the metaphor that learning to follow Jesus for a student is a lot like learning how to speak another language. How many of you speak a second language? How many of you speak a third language? Uh, how often do you need to practice to become fluent? In school, they get a couple days a week for an hour at a time. In their faith life, they get about an hour a time per week. So learning to, to follow Jesus as a different language in the normal church life is really hard when you only get an hour or so a week together in class, and then you're kind of left to do homework on your own all week long. To add to that, student ministries, you could say, speaks a certain dialect of faith with Jesus. And you all speak a different dialect of how you worship and follow Jesus. And sometimes those dialects don't communicate well. So we're going to try, not only today, but over the coming years, to become an intergenerational church that can mix and mingle those dialects. Um, but it is going to be easy. So let's just give you a little snapshot into what um, the experience was like for some of them. Uh, so let's just start out with some softball questions and the students, whoever wants to answer. Do you guys have mics? Yep. Uh, let's do this first. Um, let's do that thing where we say your name and school and, uh, and grade, just to give the congregation a chance to know your first names. All right, so say your first names, your school, and your grade. And we'll start from the end and just go down and then hit the middle of the guy. My name is Christopher. I'm in 10th grade, and I go to Rockwell High School. My name is Ryan. I'm in 10th grade, and I'm going to Bethesda Chevy Chase High School. My name is Kamar Lusan. I am a college freshman, and I'm going to the University of Maryland. My name is Melody, and I'm going into my senior year at Bethesda Chevy Chase High School. My name is Sa oh. My name's Cyan, I'm a college freshman, and I'll be attending the University of Maryland College Park. My name is Michaela, I'm a sophomore at University of Maryland, and I came on as a V team member for MOVE this year. I'm Janet, I'm a rising senior at Rockville High School. My name is Jane, and I'm a rising senior at Rockville High School. Hello, I'm Cersei, and I'm going to be a senior at Rockville High School. Hi, I'm Mimi, and I'm going to be a ninth grader at Blake. Hey, I'm Tiffany, and I'm in the 10th grade at Wheaton High School. And don't forget in the back, we have Tiara on the camera, and Michaela and Zamora backing her up, uh, and Liv and Kristen and Lisa and John and Sonia are all part of the V-Team staff. Okay. So let's start out with some softball questions. Anyone, uh, two or three of you, maybe just one of you, here's the opening prompt. That time when, I'll start every prompt with that. That time when you were surprised at what someone ate. They had been, camp was at a college dorm, and so they had college cafeteria food. And so they got the experience of what it's like to live in a dorm for a week and the all-you-can-eat college buffet. Uh, and sometimes the combinations that high schoolers put together at this all-you-can-eat buffet is a little weird. Anyone got an answer? The food, it really wasn't that bad. People were picky about food, but the workers, they really got to make a lot of food. The only bad thing was the eggs. Like, Cyan over there, she had, like, liquid eggs. It wasn't raw, but, like, it was liquidy, so that was the only bad thing for her. Additionally, 
Some people ate ice cream with every meal, every day, so. They had good chicken also. I didn't know that Kristen had this amazing dessert thing about cookies and ice cream like every chance she can get. So if ever you're looking for a gift for V-Team, cookies and ice cream. Um, when we were um, driving, we had a luggage van and we had our camp van. And what do we name the camp van? Um, named it Clifford because it was a red, big red van. It was the, in a sea of, camp, of white, big 15-passenger, 18-passenger vans at camp. Ours was the only red one. So I'm driving on the highway. I'm trying to figure out where the students are. And, this, and I'm like, oh, there it is. It was really hard to miss. And so we just called him Clifford the whole week. It was great. Um, anyone who can answer, that's two or three of you. Maybe you want to argue about this. But time to confess to your parents and the congregation. Curfew was midnight. What time did you all really go to bed? 3 a.m. What? Just the last night though, right? Every night. Hey! <laughs> she lies, it's okay. 5 a.m. was the worst night, I'm sorry. I feel like we were good about going to bed. We had to wake up so early for breakfast every day or else they would stop serving breakfast. And if you didn't get breakfast, you didn't get breakfast. So yeah, the last night we though, we did stay up a little late. We got in trouble. A little bit of trouble, eh, that's, it's okay. Um, at camp, they had the opportunity not only to sit in large group sessions, but also some workshops, and there were even some tournaments for those who are physically and athletically gifted. So how did we do? Someone tell us a 30-second story about the basketball team. Who was on the basketball team? <laughs> how did we do? And how hot was it in there? Now, we did fantastic, but it was only us four playing because nobody else wanted to play. Um, but it was us four. Other churches had, like, eight, 10, 15 people like participating. So we were tired the whole time, but we made final four. And then we played this one church, Mount Christian, but they're cool, but like, you know. And then they were cheating us the whole game. It was 2-0, but they came back. We ended up losing, but we we're the best team there. We played like final four out of like 100 teams. Like there were so many teams. It was so hot in that gym, they had to stop the tournament for a heat advisory, and they had to finish the next day. But after the first couple games, our kids came back and they were so shocked. They were like, everyone is so nice. Like, I totally stuffed that person. She was like, oh, great, great block. <laughs> and one of them, I forget who it was, was like, I need a little meanness on the court to get my juices going. Everyone's so nice, it's throwing me off my game. Um, Church camp. There were a thousand kids at this camp, but we were not anywhere near the biggest nor the smallest. But still, what did we do? Third place? Second place? I would say we got second place. We got second place, but Jesus really gave it to us as really first place, right? Um, here's a fun question I thought the congregation would like to know. You were a little surprised at whom you saw flirting. Anyone going to answer this one or just point at each other? Come on, come on. I, I want to get consent to tell the story before I do. Can I? Don't mention her name. If there's okay. A... Okay, no names. Make up a name. Um, okay, Trinity. Right? Because Holy Trinity. Okay. Yeah, so um, we were in, I think it was like the first or second day, and we were, I was walking like past Kamar. And I just see an arm going out to him. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't ask him, like, what was going on. I just, I just saw the arm going out, and she had grabbed him. And I, what did she even say to you? you Hello, I love Jesus. Right. Do you? That's probably what she said. She, so she grabbed my arm. She was like, oh, you seem cool. Like, we should get to know each other. I was like, yeah, sure. And I'm thinking, like, oh, she's, like, a church girl. So she's, like, she's chill. So then she was like... Oh, she pulled out her phone, go straight to messages. I was like, oh no, here we go. And then she was like, I should get your number. I was like, yeah, sure. I gave her my number. And then she texted me like 10 seconds after, oh, hi, Kamar. I was like, hi. And then she wanted like to, to go to some event with me, but I was like, you know. It's a pretty common youth pastor joke. Hey, uh, students in my group, uh, let's love each other. 
but let's not date inside the group because eventually we all know teenage relationships, 99 times out of 99 times, they will break up and, hi and then you have a youth group that's divided. So the youth pastor joke is, feel free to date someone who follows Jesus in another youth group, not the one here. And sometimes when we go to camp, other youth groups t take that to heart. <laughs> um, not our kids. Our kids are focused on Jesus. Um, let's do this. Someone tell a story about someone uh, who said or did something that derailed the entire group conversation. Hmm. And we're all looking at someone. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Tell a story. Anyway, <laughs> so every day we would pair up with the person we know the least and figure out three things to share that we have in common. One of these days, a few of our members decided to fib about what they have in common. And now, every time they someone lied. mentions- They lied! Every time fib. someone mentions fib. the Steelers, <laughs> we all fib. chuckle a little. No. Mm -mm. So my partner was Kumar, and um, we chose good three things. And I didn't specify that I like watching um, football. And so Kristen asked me, what's your favorite team? And so the one that came to mind was the Steelers, because they're the best. And then all week long, Can, no. you what? spent your time on your phone trying to look up who people were on this team. When she was asked, what's her favorite team, Kamar has to whisper a team to her. It was Cyan. Cyan whispered. It was a serious exercise. I'm trying to help them build community. So go find three things you have in common with one another. And so Mimi and Kamar didn't know each other all that well at the beginning of camp. And so their first answer was, uh, we're black. And then their second answer was, we both like football. At which point the whole room just kind of erupted and like, what? Mimi, name a football team, any football team. Who's the quarterback on the, like, it was just, and it was a running joke the whole week. Were there any other times when any, we kind of got derailed, something happened, when a serious moment was going on, nothing? All right, um, let's move into the second layer. So if that's the surface layer, let's move into the middle layer. You really connected with someone else, that time when you really connected with someone else. I'd say over the trip, Mimi and I have been really close. Um, even after the trip, when we went to our pool party that's supposed to help ease us back in our day-to-day -day and help us connect with those that didn't go to the trip, Mimi and I were still like really in sync with each other. I think me and Bessie got very close. We spent a lot of time together. And, you know, been in the group a while, but just getting to know her a lot better, it was really nice, you know? Hi, Bessie. Bessie couldn't be here. She lives really far away. Uh, she, she's part of our youth group, but she moved uh, way out in Frederick and couldn't be here. So hi, Bessie. Hope you're watching today. Um, I feel like I, can, I connected with everybody, because if you guys don't know, we only meet once a week on Wednesdays. So like we rarely talk about our daily lives. So on a camp like this, like we're just talking all the time. Like anytime we have free time during lunch, breakfast, dinner, we're just talking about our lives outside of church. So I feel like I connected with everybody. Church, here's the genius of camp. They come from all over Montgomery County to come together for a, a week, a, a night, one night a week. And they get a couple hours together. When we send them to camp, they're in a van for like hours at a time together. <laughs> they start pairing up, they're in roommates together, they're eating together, and they're a man on camp of a thousand people, so they kind of shrink in because they're the only ones each other know. And so for a whole day, like 24 seven, they're together for six, by the time they're, we get more time together, I did the math. It's more than two and a half years of Wednesdays in one week of camp. Um, so when you as a church send students to camp with scholarships, with financial aid, with just prayer support, it is a huge, huge lift for us. Speaking of lift, um, this question is for Jane and Janet, actually, who weren't able to come to camp with us, but um, did you guys write lift notes by any chance? 
Um, we, I did write lift notes um, when we came back on Wednesday. There's a thing we do at camp. When we get to camp, everyone gets to decorate their own envelope and we stick it up on the wall. And then all week long, during free time, sometime during sessions, uh, late at night, they're just writing encouraging notes to each other. And it's like anonymous encouragements. And they st all day long, they're just sticking these, sticking these notes into these envelopes. And because we had a group split in half this year where half the group couldn't go, we decided we're going to write lift notes for the whole youth group, whether they're at camp or not. And then when we came back, the kids at home got to write lift notes to everyone as well. And what that happens is they each go home, and we'll get better and better at this every year. They each go home with an envelope that is full of encouragement. So when they hit hard times for high school, they hit hard times for college, they hit hard times in their 20s, how many camps and retreats they've gone to, they have that many lift notes, they have that many encouragements to remind them of how God sees them, of how their Christian family sees them. Um, and so it's a really incredible, important thing. So we'll keep, getting, we'll keep doing better at those and et cetera. Um, let's go with this question. Something you learned that was new in a lesson or a workshop, a 30 second story. This is where you tell really good things. Something you learned new in a workshop or a lesson or something interesting. Maybe a verse you found funny. Uh, I learned that, um, that holding grudges or like not forgiving people, like it prevents you from connecting with God. Like if you're mad at someone or like someone did you wrong, you have to forgive them in order to further your relationship with God. Some of them are waiting because they know the deeper questions are coming and they've prepared answers for the deeper questions. <laughs> Anyone else? A verse maybe you found funny? <laughs> um, Jesus was telling a parable about a man who was forgiven by the king of his debts. Then he went to someone who owed him and I quote, he began to choke him. Pay me what you owe me. Matthew 18, 28. It's like those times, even as pastors, when you come up on a passage and you're like, I have never seen this before in my life. Even though you know you've read the Bible cover to cover several times, whatever, sometimes the verse just pops out and strikes you a little bit funny. Some of the kids, when they saw this verse up on screen, they're like, someone is choking someone in the Bible. This is just weird. And it just kind of stuck all week long with that. Um, okay, let's move to the deepest layer. Here we go. The worship lyric or the lesson moment that really hit home for you? Um, it was Wednesday night. I think we had the talker, preacher, um, she was a woman, and I just really, her message about forgiveness that Kamar was talking about, and the whole that lesson was very moving, but as it got to the end, it was just a lot of like her family dynamic she was talking about. She was talking about how when she was younger, she would have get lost, like have periods where she would be lost mentally, spiritually from Jesus, and she would like fade. And I felt like me and a lot of people can relate to that, especially through these past few years, you spiritually have like faded a little bit in and out with your um, believing and stuff and I just hit home and then right after she was done the worship team came back up and they had all this like combo of songs that was just so powerful and moving and it just really hit hard and I was talked to one of our V team members who just you know talked me through and grounded me and it was just very a good night for me I think. Okay, stop me if I'm talking for too long, but um, okay, so this song was introduced to us on the first day, and I think they played it every day. Um, it was Let It Be Done, and it was written by the worship team that was there for us at MOVE. I think it was CCV Worship, yeah. Um, yeah, so it was Let It Be Done, and one of the, the lyrics was, there's beauty in the roses, but I see thorns, and I think it was really cool how they chose that song because one of the people on the team had written it 
Um, and I think for me, I saw the, the theme of like, you aren't what you've done or what you say, because um, Jesus loves you no matter what, um, just being reiterated through that line that they played throughout. And so I thought that was really cool. There was this <clears throat> continuing message that life isn't going to be fair and it's not supposed to be fair because that's not G what Jesus promised. And I know when things happen to us, we often think like, oh, I'm such a good person. <clears throat> Why is this happening to me? But that's just not what Jesus, like, just because you're a good person doesn't mean good things are going to happen to you. In life, we're going to have struggles regardless. Last call. Anyone else? Okay, two more. That time when you thought this moment right now, maybe it doesn't make any sense to anyone else, but this moment is a God moment. Anyone have that, that conscious realization that, ooh, I'm in a God moment? I do. Okay. <laughs> So it was Wednesday night, the same night that Melody was discussing earlier. Um, Slow down. Oh, I'm so sorry. I will speak slower. Okay. So Wednesday night, the theme for the day with the, the growing and planting um, metaphor was see, sprout. sprout. Um, and the music at Move wasn't really speaking to me until Wednesday night because they hadn't been playing songs that I like really connected with God or connected to God with. And so it was Reckless Love and Oceans that they played. And there was, well, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday night, there were interactive um, just moments where you could move around the building during worship. And that one was just coming back to God, um, no matter where you were in your relationship with him. But it was just, they had the leaders of the groups go around the building and students were able to just go back to Jesus, um, just like as a symbolic thing, like just move to their leader and pray with them. Um, and they played Reckless Love, and I thought, well, the God moment for me was that, okay, the music isn't too good <laughs> so far, but them playing Reckless Love, which is like a staple for all of us because we all love that song, um, that was like the God moment. Like, the worship, your mood, what I was said, what other students were doing, it all just kind of clicked at the right moment for you. Yes. Cool. Um, I have one. So it was that same night. <laughs> yes, it's Wednesday night. And um, the story was about forgiveness. And I look over, and I know a lot of people like just looked over, the story was about to end, and we were about to go into worship, and this whole church was just like on the floor, on their knees, just like sobbing and crying out, um, and I did, and I stopped, and I prayed for them, but I could see that God was moving through that whole group, that he was there, and um, people came over to one of the boys who was on the floor and just put their hands on him and prayed for him. And I was like, God's working here. He's here. One of the cool things about camp is that they get to see how other youth groups are. It's a positive peer pressure sort of thing. They can also see the different sides of God's character in each youth group and each church. They're all different. And so you put them all together and you can kind of see what God is doing around the area. Uh, the later story in the pastor's meeting the next morning, there was a boy from a church uh, who kind of during the middle of this message just started, he just collapsed on the floor and just started wailing out to God. Uh, it was a story of the prodigal son and he was just distraught and audibly so. Um, the, speak, the next morning the speaker's like, we didn't know whether to stop and get this guy some medical care or something, but they just kind of continued. And the pastor from that group said, thank you so much. The first day we'd ever met this kid was the day he showed up to come to camp with us. And so that, I mean, some of these churches are really big, and so some, some kids just show up. And you just say, introduce yourself for the first time, and you take them to camp, and you have no idea what's going on in their soul, what's ready or not. And so uh, it was fascinating. It was so um, powerful for us 
to be supportive of another church as they were going through something traumatic for their one new person. Um, I was proud of our kids for stopping and praying. Last question before we move into a different part. Um, how many of you were a little hesitant about going? It's a week long. It was supposed to be incredibly hot and incredibly thunderstormy and very expensive and college food. And uh, I, how many of you, were, you had some degree of hesitation about going? <laughs> v team. Yeah, for the adults, we have to sleep on college mattresses again. Oh, that's. Whew. I closed my exercise ring three times each day. Um, um, when did you know this is worth it? Anyone have an answer for that? I was meant to be here. This is worth it. I think about Ryan in the fountain. <laughs> We were messing around and we found this fountain. It was so hot out. And so some of the kids are like, oh, let's, let's have a baptism. And Ryan's like, I want to be baptized. I'm like, wait, you've already been baptized. But, oh. um, there was one night where we were all talking. I forget what night it was. But, and I forget the question. But I, the, that night, like, we were all opening up. And usually when I speak, like, I'm good at, like, saying something but not saying anything. Like I'll talk about myself without revealing too much. And that night I actually like opened up and I felt like it was good for me to like talk about stuff that actually like mattered to me, like in front of the group instead of just, you know, dodging the question. And we appreciated it too. Anyone else? This is worth it. This was a different baptismal at the same fountain, but this time we were going to again baptize Mimi because we were on our prayer walk guided by the Lord. It's okay that we missed a little bit of our lesson, but this was for Mimi. And in that moment of community between me, Mimi, and Lisa, we're, at, we're alone, it's night. I just thought to myself that I love being here with these people. Part of the joy of being a V team member is the relationship dynamic. And so when Lisa gets lost on the way to the large group room and makes up a story and has the students follow her little fib, it creates a bond of a great relationship dynamic. I'm pretty sure maybe that's how that happened. Um, but the more time we get to spend with them, the more comfortable they are with us and the more we can help them see where God is in their life. It's very hard to help a stranger know where God is in their life. Until you love them, until you care for them, how do you share the gospel with them? So that's part of our role as adults, as a church, is to love on these students enough such that we can help them see where God is in their life. Now comes the risky part. Uh, we have a mic, and Carol's got a microphone. And I'm gonna open it up to you. Do you have any questions that you wanna ask the students about anything like stuff they have learned or saw, the kids who were at home. Uh, we just open the floor if you have any questions, anything you want to ask. Things like describe your week in a word or some other social dynamic or a spiritual lesson or something. Describe, etc. If you have a question, raise your hand and Carol will come to you and we'll see how they answer. I haven't prepped the kids. I have, we have no idea what questions are out there. We'll see what comes out of their mouths. Hopefully it's holy. What part of camp do you wish we could bring back and incorporate into the routine here at Pathways? Oh, good question. I don't know if we have the budget for this, but <laughs> <laughs> completely rearranging like the, the sound equipment and like, I don't know if we can make it concert-like in here with the lights and everything, but I think we should because the way that move works is, as Jonathan likes to say, your spleen moves as you worship because it's just so loud and the bass is booming and people are jumping and laughing and crying. And it's just like a completely different worship experience than what it is on normal Sundays. So I wish you could bring that part in. A thousand kids in a gym, a speaker system built for a, a concert house. You, as soon as they started worship, you saw all the adults make a beeline for the walls in the back and all the kids run up front, and it was just like, I was nauseous from the side. It's like, oh, oh. And that's when I knew I'm old, man. 
Anything else? Anything from camp that you want to bring back? For students at home, like, uh, you want to, I want you guys to, bring, you guys talk about this, I want you guys to do it here. But anything. Drive around in a big red van. Any other questions out there? Sonia's got a question, Carol. Anyone else that we know who to go to next? First of all, I'm so incredibly sad that I had to miss being with you all. I, I'm just watching all of this, and I, I loved being with you guys when I got to go to MOVE last time, so, so sorry I missed it. But my question is, the level of community and connection that you guys had before you left, well, how would you say that's changed? Give it a number. Before, we were probably at community level one through 10, but now we're at. Um, I would give it like a th two or a three before we left because, again, only Wednesday nights, but then also we haven't all been at church or we haven't been doing that many like events outside of um, church. And But now after, I feel like we're at a nine or a 10. Um, in our bonding, like our bonded vibes, and it was just really nice. And every time there was any moments, like Kumar was saying, we would just be talking about random stuff, or there was big campus, so we had to walk everywhere, and so we walked in groups and would just be talking. Every meal, we would just be bonding to where, like one night during worship, we were all just like holding arms like this. <laughs> <laughs> Other churches took a picture of that moment and sent it to really? me. Really? Oh my They God. saw you do it. Like, that is so cool. It was just so bonded. I love that. So I didn't go, but I did notice a lot. So on Wednesday before they left, right? No, it was like the time we had the, you know, the youth group. And then I noticed like before move, not everybody was so close, like not everybody talked to everybody, you, you understand? So when they came back from MOVE, we all had a pool party at Michaela's house. And so I noticed that everybody was playing together. Um, there were, we were all swimming around, making jokes, eating, everybody was so close. and. Yeah, that's something I really noticed because usually not everybody would talk to everyone. Like for me, I wouldn't talk to everybody. But even though I didn't go, I noticed that everybody was close. I was like, hey, might as well. This is one of those dialect things. For students, it is almost impossible for a student in a youth group to grow with Jesus unless they feel comfortable with that group. I'm not so sure that's different for us as adults. Um, but we like to pretend that it is on Sunday mornings. You can come and sit and do your thing. That's why we keep encouraging you all to come to class or come to small group or do, join a team um, so that you can have community, so that you are comfortable, so that you can reveal and release and participate in a growth with Jesus with whom you're comfortable with. Uh, so Speaking about that, uh, first of all, thank you for, to the leadership of the team and the students participating and getting away and connecting with each other and with others. I'm curious to hear, um, so how do you apply what you've experienced this week or even in the context of the group over the year uh, in your lives, in your lives uh, with each other in this church, but really specifically as you go back to your respective uh, schools, and you're not all together, right? Some of, maybe some of you are, I'm not sure, <laughs> in the same schools. But how do you take these experiences, who Jesus is in your life, and kind of apply it in your life to impact others? I'm just curious about that. Um, we had a, an activity where you had to pick someone to forgive, that you needed to forgive in your regular life, could be part of your family or a friend. And I had a f 
few people in mind that I knew I had like grudges against or just like animosity, but like in my own, I didn't like act on it or anything. But I realized that I, it wasn't getting me anywhere and holding the grudges don't, it doesn't, doesn't mean I forget it, but I can forgive them and move forward. And so I'm applying that by maybe not talking to those people in person, but in my own mind, forgiving them and for, you know, just getting it out, getting over it and being mature about it. Um, move is a little bit special. There's a little thing, they're called kingdom workers when they go to camp, which is kind of a cool thing. So they're called kingdom workers and they're meant to make a benefit in the world. And so they give them these little cards, kingdom worker cards, where there's a whole sea of these little white cards that are kingdom worker cards laid out. And we prep the students in a divine moment. You walk up to whichever table you wish and you put your hand out and you trust that in that card, God has a unique challenge for you. And these challenges are not easy. In past youth groups, it required three or four of these students to make this thing happen. They're year-long projects. These are serious. These are big projects. Um, and so Kamar and uh, Cyan, since they have graduated and are moving on, they chose their cards early. The rest of them will get their chance later this fall to open their card. But oddly enough, out of like 50 cards, they got the same card. Um, what was that card? Um, it was take choose one day out of the week and not go on social media, don't play video games, don't watch TV, and find a way to serve your family or friends. Watch TV was not on the card. Um, <laughs> I think it was just Sorry, playing video games and social media. <laughs> um, how many of you could give up your all screens for a day, once a day, every week for 52 weeks? Maybe some of the adults should take on this challenge. It is the lifeblood of a teenager's community. And to say, unplug from this and let God speak to you. And let God restore your imago Dei, your image. Let me, your father, remind you of who you are without this constant influx of media and images and comparisons and et cetera. This is not, I mean, it sounds like a kind of a, an easy challenge, but this is not. So we'll keep them accountable. And for those of you who are Pray For Me champions, you might, if you have Cyan or Kamar, you might text them an encouragement, not on their day that they're trying to avoid all that, but um, encourage them. Uh, and if they have slipped off, like, hey, remember that challenge, you can get started again. I wanna ask this, I wanna move to the next section. I'm gonna ask one or two of you, um, really short prayers. I'm gonna move to a different section. Um, can I have one or two of you volunteer to pray a blessing? over Saya and our tech team kids and our students, all of our youth group kids. Can I have you pray for this generation of students in a short way? Anyone volunteer to pray out loud? On mic, during service that's being streamed live. Thanks, John. Thank you, Georgia. We'll go John, then Georgia. Let's pray. Father, as I hear the stories and hear how you touched lives this week, I'm, I'm greatly encouraged. To see you draw our kids closer to each other gives them the sense and the knowledge and the hope and the faith that you are there and they are drawn together by you. And I just pray that uh, as they reflect on this past week, that the memories and the thoughts and the experiences don't fade, but they actually draw them closer to you. And especially for 
Kamar and Cyan as, as you're bringing them to that next step in their life, Lord. It's going to be a challenge. I understand that challenge, having a daughter that's graduating from college next year and, and has been through that freshman step and that challenge. So, Lord, I just continue to ask that the seeds that you've planted this week in their hearts will continue to grow, that they will seek you in the struggling moments, that they will praise you in the good times, that they will be strengthened during the challenges and during the temptations that are going to come with being in a new world and a different world. I ask that you be with them. I ask that you be with all of our youth group as they continue to move on in life. Help them to reach out to one another in, in times of stress and times of struggle and encourage one another. Put upon their hearts to pray for each other. And I just ask for your blessing upon all that you have for them as they continue their walk with you. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious moment where we can hear from the voices of our children. It is not often that we have this opportunity to understand how they see you, how they worship you, and how they want to worship you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who are here, who are, have the opportunity to work at church students who are volunteering to bring your word to the world. They are on the tech team. They may have went on the trip. They may have not went on the trip, but they somehow participated to do your will. Help them to continue to find treasures in heaven and to not lay up treasures on earth. Let them remember all that they have learned so that when they grow up, they will remember that and put that to work. Heavenly Father, we ask that your favor goes before them, that you open up doors for them that may be closed, that you will help them to walk through those doors with faith, and that everything that they do, they will seek you first. Heavenly Father, we ask that you cover them as they go out into the world, and they go from experiences to experiences, that your word would stay with them and they will grow from glory to glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing your kids unto you. You said, suffer the little children to come unto you and you will receive them in your bosom. Carry them, Heavenly Father, through every single step. Help them to remember you. Help them to thank you. Help them not to forget where their strength come from, for their strength cometh from the Lord. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins and to, and to cover our children. Heavenly Father, we pray that they will always remember you and they will always pray um, that you would continue, that they will continue to grow um, in your spirit this we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> amen. I'm going to invite the Sela team to the front and the rest of you uh, may be seated. Um, the students would like to give you a gift. This was perhaps the most challenging moment for them at camp. 
It's called a Selah moment. This word appears in scripture. Um, and frankly, we don't really know what it means. We think after every psalm, when it says Selah, we think maybe it, says, it means pause or reflect or celebrate. And so this next three minutes will just be silence. And the students will guide you in your internal prayers. Jero and his skill will accompany you. But they're going to lead you in what's called a Selah moment. Uh, and if we can invite you to participate in this holy moment. The S in Selah stands for stop. The world we live in doesn't naturally lead us to times where we can just stop. It's usually go, go, go. Do you feel like life is that way? You wake up, quickly eat something, or just skip breakfast altogether. Then get dressed, head out the door to school or work. After that, fight traffic, get home, see to the family, prepare meals, do evening chores, maybe finish up work or homework, and check in with the family again. Finally, you head to bed, where you have to binge watch a few episodes of your show. There's no time to just breathe. <clears throat> well, that's different today you have a chance to just stop. So I wanna invite you to do just that. Just stop. Stop planning what you're going to do later. Stop worrying about what's going on with loved ones. Stop messing with your phone for just a few moments. Whatever it is, just stop. Lay it aside and just be still. Jesus is sending out a broadcast to you today and is inviting you to spend just a few moments with him. Will you take him up on it? Will you listen? Spend just a few moments in quiet, settling your mind and heart. The Ian Stela stands for exhale. This is time to catch your breath, to just settle in a little more in a little more deeply to be in Jesus' presence. Take three big deep breaths and slowly exhale each time. Start a simple prayer as you breathe by saying, Jesus, let your word. Then as you exhale, continue the prayer with, take root in my heart. This may be a little weird for you, but resist the urge to rush through it. Remain fully present and don't go to the things that you stop doing at first. Be attentive to what Jesus has for you in this moment. We have stopped, we have exhaled, and we have settled in. And now I'd like to ask you to look. What if Jesus has spiritual treasures that he wants you to discover today? What if there's a precious pearl hidden in the ordinary field for you to find today? Wouldn't that be exciting? In order to discover it, examine your heart would be helpful to look. 
Remember, Jesus' parable of the soils. Have you been able to see where there is hardness in your heart? What about rocks? or things that keep you from being able to receive what God might have for you. There are also weeds and thorns in the parable of soils. Are there things that choke out what God has for you? Are there worries and concerns that keep you from Jesus? Take a few moments to check your heart. Be honest with yourself. Submit to Jesus the parts of your heart that need attention. Ask. Now, let's ask Jesus for help. The reality is that he can see your heart better than even you can. Take the next moments and talk to him. You don't have to use fancy words or try to sound super spiritual. Just be honest with him and tell him what's going on in your head and heart. But then, pay attention to how he might respond. Here's the question to ask him this morning. Jesus, what keeps me from seeing how valuable you and your kingdom are? Ask him that, and pay attention if he brings something to your mind. Finally, here, this Selah moment will close out with the words from Jesus. Even as the passage is read, listen carefully for any words or phrases that stand out to you, and write them down when you hear them. We'll read through the passage twice. You're familiar with the command to the ancients, do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is, not, who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot, and you just might find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister, and you are on the brink of hellfire. The simple moral fact is that words kill. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you. Abandon your offering. Leave immediately. Go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then, come back, work things out with God. You're familiar with the command to the ancients. Do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot, and you just might find yourself hauled into court. 
thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister and you're on the brink of hellfire. The simple moral fact is that words kill. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you. Abandon your offering. Leave immediately. Go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then, come back and work things out with God. Matthew 21, 24. When you walked in, you were given a little wooden bamboo tag and a pen. We'd like to give you the opportunity to practice uh, the sermon that the students have been giving to you today about forgiveness. So I'd like you to take that pen and on one side of that bamboo tag, write your name, just your first name. And then when you are ready, turn that tag over. And again, just the first name or description, doesn't matter. Uh, write the name of the person with whom you have had long and hard conflict. Someone you need to ask forgiveness from or someone you just need to forgive. The theme of the week for the students was the parable of the four soils. And they got to a place where they were no longer able to grow because it was dry in a desert land because of the unforgiveness in their heart. If there was someone for you in your life in this way, we invite you to write that name, and then when you are ready to come plant it in the desert soil here. <laughs> 